Okay, so we'll begin. Uh, thank you very much for joining our session. So today we are going to talk about uh, incorporating inquiry-based learning activities in the teaching of chemistry. Some of the materials being shared, um, you can, or rather all the materials, they are actually found in the uh, QR code. And I think uh, Justin has also kindly uh, sent a link uh, in the uh, chat. So you might just want to click on it. Uh, and that includes the slides. Okay, so you can follow some of the presentation uh, in a clearer fashion. Yeah, so maybe I just introduce uh, myself. I'm Chong Shin. Um, my co presenter is Jaslyn. Both of us are from um, Archong. Yeah, so uh, today we have the privilege to present uh, some of the things which we have uh, done for the, for the past um, three years or three years. Okay, so yeah, I will begin. Okay, so right now, okay, okay, so now we, I just want to show you this little slides, um, which you can actually um, also scan the QR code and go on and uh, take a look at some of the interesting findings uh, by the universities. Yeah, so true enough, chemistry is a very challenging course, uh, even for students in universities. So if you just go to the website, you will notice that um, students who are able to perform abstract thinking, right? They are able to uh, perform better in chemistry. Yeah. So this is the this is the reality out there. Whether we are talking about Asia or we are talking about um, the Western countries, chemistry has always been a very challenging subject. Uh, not to say physics, bio, they are not. Yeah, but um, for some reason, perhaps there are more um, uh, students picking up uh, chemistry kind of causes for for reasons uh, I think all of us know because chemistry is uh, required um, as an entry level course uh, in medicinal chemistry, uh, life science, uh, biomedical engineering, etc. So probably because of that, um, it poses a lot of challenge uh, to, to students. Yeah. So I thought um, I just want to frame our discussion or the reason why we use inquiry based inquiry based learning. Um, by focusing on, on what the universities um, have for us. Okay, then um, I'm not going to bore you with all these details because um, some of you, if you have attended some of our workshops before, I also have talked a little bit about it. Um, these are the practices of science which requires higher order thinking um, in chemistry. So for example, in H2 chem, um, the students are supposed to um, understand and analyze and evaluate uh, real world information like for example in database question this is not only in h2 camp but also in uh, o-level chemistry okay so i'm just going to uh, let you see some of the slides okay so you can see that important skills includes analyze and interpret data and of course decision making and how to communicate the information they have gathered to their peers and of course to, to adults like uh, teachers like us. And of course, um, students who are more able, we subject them, um, we allow them to do more research-based kind of uh, chemistry. Yeah, so in that case, they are able to communicate their findings um, in a scientifically correct manner. And uh, in that case, they also need to know how to make the information accessible to the general public, as well as uh, how to make it um, scientifically correct uh, to the professionals. Okay, yeah. Then, um, I'm, we are aware that most of the audience came from, I mean, you are from O-level school as well. So, in fact, such thinking is also important for O-level chemistry. Uh, in fact, I, I have friends teaching in O-level chemistry. They show me some of the database questions, and these are very difficult. I, I, I think if, if we give it to some of our students, they might not be able to do as well. So, again, you can see some of the common skills, effective communication, and uh, how to recognize the usefulness limitation of the scientific models. Okay, yeah, so we have all this in our uh, syllabus learning objective. Of course, syllabus is going to change, but objective will not change. Uh, we still require these skills. And of course, such skills cannot be taught. Yeah, so about a decade ago, I attended uh, some courses, and I really love this solo taxonomy because it gives you a pictorial representation of um, how the students is able to interrelate things that they have learned. Yeah, so I will just move on to the next level. So for example, for multi-structural, right, the students understand different concepts in silos, but may not be able to integrate them uh, to the next level, we call that relational. Yeah, so of course, um, 
most of us, when we teach, we hope that the students are able to reach at least the relational level or maybe in between multi-structure and relational level before they go for their major assessment. Uh, yeah, because we understand that for some students, the runway is longer. So we are not expecting everyone to be able to reach at, at standard abstract level. Okay, we're really not ex expecting that. But we just hope that um, upon having this understanding, we are able to design some activities uh, so that they can form the necessary cross-link to achieve this level. Okay, yeah. So in one of the NLC that I'm running, right, we are also focusing on giving the students the deeper learning experience. Okay, I'm not going to go into details as well, but this is just one slide uh, to show you that what exactly is the definition of deeper learning. Okay, so um, when a person is able to um, pick what they learn in one situation and transfer it to another. So that is essentially what we're looking at for the extended abstract level. So you can see that no matter what model or what kind of studies we use, right, we all point to the fact that we want our students to be able to perform higher order thinking. Yeah, so I mean, just, just, a, just a quick snapshot of that. And of course, I particularly love this book, In Search uh, of Deeper uh, Learning, because in this particular book, uh, it showcased the competencies the students need to achieve in order to um, attain or in order to, to be so-called um, have that necessary kind of deeper learning. Okay, uh, again, I, the purpose of this uh, presentation is not go, to go into details in deeper learning, but uh, we thought that we just want to give you a background so that uh, those of us who are interested, you can actually read more about, about them. Okay, so uh, these are deeper learning competencies we are talking about. Um, and how do we assess them? We assess them through performance-based assessment, yeah, which is actually a workshop we ran um, a month ago. Yeah, okay, so uh, again, I will not go into details. If you are interested, uh, this is reference for you. Uh, you can read more about it. Yeah, it's a very thin book, uh, quite a nice read. Okay, yeah. So uh, before we go into our presentation proper, because I am aware that uh, most of us, when we come for presentation, right, we really just want to know uh, what has been done and not all the theory. So uh, do pardon me that just now I need to frame the presentation a little bit because I, I, I need to let you know the purpose of us doing certain things. Yeah, so now we are really going into the, the, the proper presentation. But uh, before that, um, we need to let you know the profile of our students. Yeah, so in Hua Chong uh, Institution College section, right, uh, for H2 chemistry, the cohort is about Eight to nine hundred students. So now it's close closer to eight hundred than nine hundred. Okay, and we have about hundred students per cohort taking special program. Um, I will not elaborate more on special program, but it's more of um programs where we are able to maybe do more with the students. Yeah, it's quite similar to the school based gifted education in secondary school. Yeah, but um, I will not go into details. If you are interested, you can uh, email us or just just have a chat later on. Yeah, and also. Those of you who are not familiar with JC curriculum, there's something known as H3. So for H3, it's a separate exam paper. It's quite similar to the special paper we did when we were in uh, secondary school. I was say, I mean, when we were doing uh, JC um, in the 90s or in the 80s, yeah, it's it's no longer called special paper, it's called H3. Yeah. So in general, Papua has the largest cohort in the whole of Singapore. We have close to 80 students. Um, from the numbers we, we got for our current JC2, um, the, in 2023, we have about 100 H3 students. So I just need to give you a, a sense of the profile of the students so that you roughly know uh, why we are doing certain things. Okay, and uh, this is a timeline of our so-called major assessment. Um, may not be very interesting, but uh, again, I will not go into details because usually I will share a little bit about this to our international audience. Uh, yeah, on uh, what are these? Yeah, basically these are just checkpoint assessment to find out their readiness or to find out how much they have learned from their uh, previous uh, um, previous few months of uh, learning. Okay, usually the most important exam in GCY is the promotion exam. And of course, before the A-levels, you'll be the preliminary exam. Okay, so, so for our international audience, yeah, this is just a, a, a frame, I mean, the assessment framework for two years. Okay, yeah, then um, for inquiry based learning, right, there are a lot of models, but um, today I just, I thought I just want to, uh, again, as I mentioned, I will not go into details, but um, I'm just going to show you this 5E model. So we're going to engage the uh, uh, students and then of course to let them uh, perform some exploration um, in a phenomenon. And then of course we get the students to try to explain certain things and of course uh, 
At the same time, the teacher will also come in, interject, and uh, provide our input. Okay, and of course, we need to check whether the student is able to elaborate, uh, apply the new situation. So that's the kind of uh, extended abstract or even um, abstract kind of thinking that we need. And of course, at the end, uh, the students will evaluate their learning through uh, some form of assessment. Usually, it will be in the form of a class exercise or maybe um, a term uh, assessment. But but we are really doing away with a lot of assessment. So a lot of them are formative in nature. Sometimes we don't even give marks. Yeah, we, we just give them comments and, and usually that, that, that will suffice. Okay, yeah. So um, today we're going to share with you three topics which we have done. Yeah, so uh, I'll share chemical bonding and then uh, Justin will take over from there to continue with another two topics. Yeah, so I just want to give everyone a context of uh, chemical bonding. Yeah, so in Hua Chong, chemical bonding is taught in, uh, as a second topic. So I'll just give uh, everyone a glimpse of this particular example. So I put it 2021 because we did that last year. Okay, yeah, then um, the second bullet point, basically just, I'm just trying to share with everyone that, okay, so you might want to know um, the hours dedicated to lectures and maybe tutorials because in JC, we run like a lecture tutorial kind of system. Uh, of course, due to COVID, um, there's some involvement. Okay, so we no longer have face-to-face -face lecture, so a lot of it is flipped. So the students will, will view the online lecture and then um, during the actual lecture slots, then of course the, the teacher can choose to uh, go through um, uh, important parts with the students. So we really do that for, the, uh, for every different classes. Okay, yeah, so it's about 3.25 hours, so that includes uh, understanding the materials, etc. And then we have 6.5 hours of tutorial. Yeah, and then, um, Based on past experience, we noticed that uh, students have difficulty understanding uh, mixing, uh, dissolution of substance, or even intermolecular force of attraction. Uh, then some of us might be wondering, if back when we were, when we were students, but it seems quite easy in that sense, right? Uh, I, I would say easy in the sense, um, if you um, can visualize certain things or if you can uh, do it, physically uh, in the lab, then I think the knowledge will sink in. So with that motivation, right, uh, what we did was we actually designed um, a series of uh, exercises for them to go through in the, in, in the tutorial so that they are able to understand this concept a little bit better. Okay, and in most cases, without the inquiry page, right, these concepts when it's taught to the students, right, they are largely just uh, uh, words and then uh, teacher tell you you just believe that it is like that without actually uh, visualizing the phenomenon okay and then of course the implementation um will be before going through that section of the tutorial okay so uh i'm sorry that i didn't elaborate this a little bit okay so normally in Hua Chong, right uh intermolecular fossil attractions mixing dissolution they are packed at the end of the tutorial for the whole chemical bonding right? so you can just imagine that in chemical bonding they learn about covalent bond ionic bonding uh, metallic bonding hybridization so abstract right then towards the end it seems a lot of words in the lecture notes talking about dissolution then it can get a bit dry and sometimes students will not really pay attention that's why they are particularly weak in these those areas <laughs> yeah so um in that sense before you go through that section of the tutorial or even the lecture notes depending on how the teacher want to plan it we can actually inject this activity yeah so that's the background okay so i just oh, uh you have access to the worksheet in the google drive so uh but i'm not in uh, i don't i don't want to toggle between the worksheets and my presentation so over here i'm just going to show you uh a snapshot of what the worksheet uh. so uh this is basically uh in a setting where the students are put into uh groups okay so uh we'll, we'll let each group have a test tube or something oh, and then after that um we'll give them some information and then of course um because they're in jc1 they don't really learn a lot of organic chem so uh we we're not able to we're not expecting them to remember the structure yeah so we just give them the structure okay you can see that it's quite ugly it's full display but no choice because uh i think this is really to help the students and then we give them density uh, some some teachers in the past feedback that we gave them density to trick the students but, uh, not really to trick the students but it's true that this data should be given and then of course we will ask them uh, to draw up what they think it is going to be like when you mix 
say in this case acetone and water. Yeah. So they're gonna they're, 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 they're gonna predict what uh, what they're gonna draw. And of course, um now the teacher the teacher's role is very important now, it's the facilitator. Yeah, so we no longer teach them, we just say we 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 need to remind the students that you know when you predict that they are going to be of a certain diagram, right? Or of a certain drawing, right? You need to sort of explain to your peers why that is the case. Right? Yeah. So a very common thing will be let's say students are not so sharp, they will think that, oh, you know, actually acetone floats on top of water. Like, yeah. But of course, it's okay to make mistakes. It's perfectly fine. Because when they carry out the mixing, right, they realize it's one whole layer, then they need to find an explanation for that. Yeah. So basically, you can sort of see that. Uh, the role of the teacher now is quite important because we, we, we no longer tell them what to do, uh, teach the content, but we, we allow them to make mistakes and then for the mistake, uh, understand what exactly is going on or try to explain to each other what's going on. Yeah, so the, the whole worksheet goes something like this. Like, so uh, again, I'm not going to bore you the details about this, but some of the parts are inherently more difficult than others. Like. Yeah, so if you, um, if you want to do it in a differentiated way, maybe certain parts you can actually remove them and not give your students yeah so this is actually part of the answer like. and this is actually the more difficult part like, when we actually ask the students to add uh copper sulfate and then later on um we we we, we ask them to add copper sulfate in uh at acetone and then after that add water and see what happens like. so it's actually more challenging for the students yeah so uh this this is the answer uh the answer sheet is also in the google drive so if you wish to you can just click open and then uh just look through the answers the answers are not perfect of course yeah uh, we, we just write in whatever we think uh it's uh, important for the students yeah okay yeah so uh i think the most beautiful one is this yeah so if you are interested uh we, we there's actually a youtube link here you you can click uh this youtube link is actually created to explain uh, all the different kind of transition uh, inorganic qualitative analysis in the data booklet and the section at the end right will explain uh, the color the difference of the color when uh, iodine is being mixed into hexane and water okay so if you wish to you can just click on the link um, in your in the PDF version okay yeah and then, um, of course, learning design map uh, allow us to see in a big picture way uh, what are activities taking place in class, outside the class, uh, and how they are actually engaging with the teachers. So uh, if you are interested, yeah, this is how the learning design map looks like. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but uh, what I'm going to share is uh, this lesson usually is, is recommended to be carried out uh, in about a 1.5 hours period and we are not expecting um, every student to complete everything because uh, again uh, they are at a different pace so it's okay that some of them are a little bit slower they can't finish so they can take home and then after that when the students come back uh, we can review what we have done uh, in the tutorial yeah so it definitely cannot be done in one lesson yeah so the bulk of the um, hands-on actually happens in that 1.5 hours Okay, yeah. So with that, um, I will pass to Jasmine where she will um, discuss the next topic. Uh, yeah, so uh, Jasmine, I will pass to you. Yeah, I'll just... Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. I hope you can hear me and see the screen. Yeah, so um, following Chongxin's um, example um, of the activity he did with his students i also um, had two other activities that i crafted to to do with my students uh, um, for two different topics so the first one you can see is on geisha state so it's one of the topic that is like kind of new from o level chemistry to a level chemistry right so uh, for some of you who may not be as familiar uh, with the what is covered in state la, for a level so i've just extracted some of the key concepts that um the students need to learn so as you can see um because we're dealing with the ideal gas law a lot of it is just some um, mathematical ma manipulation and because of that um 
given the profile of our students, most of them are pretty strong in, in math. So when it comes to dealing with numbers, they usually do not have so much difficulty. But what I've come to realize as I was teaching them, I realized that actually sometimes when the questions, they just change the context a little, where it requires the students to, to have more application to real life scenarios. That's where they struggle a bit. So actually the aim of my um, exercise with them was to help them uh, to um, learn how to apply some of their understanding they learned in, in the tutorials to what's happening in the real world. Okay, so uh, similarly, the time allocated we have in our curriculum is around one and a half hours for a lecture and two and a half hours for tutorials. Okay, so um, this is also a simple lesson design map. So uh, like what was mentioned by Chongxin, right? So most of our students actually now kind of do their self-directed learning before coming for tutorials. So that is what you can see in activity one. And then after that, when we come back to classes, we can either discuss some of the tutorial questions or we have also prepared some um, class exercises for them to, to work on on the spot so that the teacher can also use that as like a simple form of uh, assessment for learning to check their understanding. So um, um, following which uh, activity three is what, what I'm going to share with you uh, very quickly, right, next, um, how I got them to deal with a real world application. Okay, so um, for me, because um, actually when it comes to Geisha State, there are actually a lot of real life applications, like some of the gas canisters we use at home, uh, even like fire extinguishers. But one of it, um, which I thought was quite interesting, uh, was scuba diving. So actually, um, there, are, there is a lot of um, different physics concepts um, involved in when it comes to the, the science of scuba diving. Okay, but after looking through all of it, I decided to extract some of it which are which were more relevant for um a H2 chemistry standard. Right. So uh, as you can see on your left, you have the buoyancy control device, uh, which we can then um kind of extract some of the pressure volume relationships for students to uh, apply. So um, moving down, we have the regulator. So it's the mouthpiece that the scuba divers have. Lah, right. So with that, um, with that piece of equipment, we can also have some pressure volume relationships and also some pressure temperature relationships. Like uh, when the diver goes into the sea, there is drop in temperatures like, as compared to atmospheric level. Yeah. And then the last one, uh, which we commonly see the, the two canisters, the uh, divers carry when they go down. So that's where the gas tank itself can allow students to apply some of the um, concepts regarding Avogadro's law. Um, something which was um, quite, um, I would say, interesting uh, when it comes to, like, for example, divers, they need to calculate whether the tank, the amount of oxygen or gas they have is enough to last them for their whole duration of the dive. So that's where the concept of gas uh, consumption rate came in. Uh. Okay, so I've just extracted an example of the worksheet I had. So, um, sorry, let me just go back. So as you can see, I kind of had um, around three main concepts, but I split it up into um, four stations. So I decided to adopt the um, like a station rotation format for my students to go through these different um, like equipments to kind of go step by step to apply some of the understanding. Okay, so uh, just for today, I'm extracting um, one section for you to get a better idea. But uh, like, like what was mentioned, the resources are in the Google um, folder that we also shared with you all. Okay, so uh, on your left, you see that it's like an information sheet I prepared for each of the stations. So when the students, which I already grouped them beforehand, right? So once they get to the stations, they will kind of read the information sheet to kind of learn a bit more on uh, what they're going to deal with regarding the scuba gas tank. Okay, so on the right, you see it's um, actually like the student's copy of the work, uh, worksheet. So that's where um, after they read the like uh, information sheet, then the, in the groups, right, they can start to discuss some of um, the questions I've prepared, right? So for example, in the first question, you can see that I got them to try to compare the amount of oxygen in 12 liters of air versus um, the same volume in a scuba tank, but at a different pressure, right? Because it's a pressurized gas tank. So with that, sometimes at the start, they will get a bit like, stunted right they are a bit unsure of how to approach so that's where i kind of like just hint them a bit more say that oh what would we learn um if you look at ideal gas equation what are relationships we can adopt so usually after a bit of prompting they start to see that hey, actually a lot of what um 
I'm expecting them to do in this like a uh, short uh, inquiry activity, right? It's just to adapt some of their understanding from what they've already learned, right? Okay, so uh, that is for this station, right? And then um, for the next um, activity, which I also prepared uh, with for my students, is on another topic called uh, chemical equilibrium. It's one of the um, bigger chapters we have under physical chemistry, lah, right? Okay, so um, the aim of the lesson was also for them to kind of get more familiar with how do we actually apply um, Le Chatelier's principle uh, to kind of um, deduce some of the observations from experiments or when it comes to questions, kind of apply the uh, theory to, to explain some of the uh, different uh, observations lah, right okay so yeah similarly the time we had for lectures two and a half hours and three and a half for tutorials okay so um for this uh, inquiry activity right um different from what Changxin shared earlier on the five e's i've decided to use a slightly different framework because i've learned it from uh, another course i've attended lah, okay so this framework um is actually called the three c's right um so if uh, as you can see from the diagram I had on the I have on the slide, the first C is um the about the part on capturing the interest of students. So that's very uh, similar to what we're familiar with in the STP when, when it comes to activating interest of the students. Okay, so moving on, that's where we can think about. Okay, that's like the lesson introduction, right? But when we're going to the main bulk of the lesson, where you have to construct some of the understanding regarding cert regarding certain concepts, so that's where the second C comes in. But under the second C of construct, there is also a mini, um, like a cycle happening. So when they prepare, they are preparing to investigate. When they actually go on to conduct the investigation, and then after that, um see whether the students can craft suitable explain explanations based on what they have uh what evidence they have collected okay so um this this kind of um cycle is actually another way um of looking at assessment for learning right so once the students are able to craft the explanations that's where the teacher gets the cue like oh okay the students actually kind of have mastered the application or like mastered how to use the um, theory they have applied okay so the last one the last c consolidate is also another form of afl but that's where the teacher can decide okay from what we've done in this lesson go on to look at subsequent related concepts uh, within the chapter or either across uh chapters lah. okay so um the research paper for this uh, framework is also available in the resource folder if you are interested you can uh read more on it lah. okay so um Using the three C's, I've prepared this lesson. So um, this is just a more specific um, lesson design for what, I've, what I'm going to be talking about. So I will not delve into details. So I um, just want to let you have a visual <laughs> um, understanding of what I prepared. Lah, right? So because there are two main investigations I'm getting them to do, um, uh, of course, that, that means um, there are quite a bit of materials to prepare. Yeah, but um, it is uh, mainly regarding this uh, cobalt 2 plus complexes, right? So it's uh, the cobalt um, uh, CO2 plus solution. In fact, it's a very nice pink color. But when it, when it um, forms complexes with the chloride ions, that's where it changes color. Okay, uh, so this is also the worksheet I've prepared. But this one, um, I've done it up in more of a guided inquiry style okay so uh, uh on the left you can see the first page is where i kind of gave the students some of the background regarding this um cobalt complex because the students in year one they still have not uh, learned much on transition elements and some of the chemistry around it so that's where i give them some um, background information like um the color you will be expecting to see for a certain uh compound like i just told them it's a compound for now okay so um from there the first three questions you can see right it's actually very simple uh they just need to think okay if i see more pink or more blue or if i see a purple solution what does it mean in terms of like the proportion of the two different components inside the uh, mixture right okay and then from there um we extend the understanding to how that um the relative concentrations can tell us the position of equilibrium which is uh, going towards the main um lesson objective right so on the right you can see the second page of the worksheet that's where they actually go on to look at the first uh investigation to understand like how does the position of equilibrium shift when i keep adding uh, calcium chloride 
uh, which is the source of our chloride ions for this investigation. Uh. Yeah, so going down uh, for question four, is just uh, to guide them to do each step of the inquiry. And then when we go to question five, uh, I eventually scaffolded it a bit more to help them craft their explanations because I realize sometimes um, students, they kind of can imagine what's happening, but they don't know how to put it in words. So that's where... Um, this is like a very simple, like just choose which option you circle. And then if you find that this is, um, I found that this helped them, help some of the students who are weaker to, to write their explanations appropriately. Yeah, so this is um, just a snapshot of what was happening like, in this uh, inquiry lesson. Yeah, okay, so. Um, um, excuse me, a 15 yeah. minutes left for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, this was um, the vi this is a very short video I have for the second investigation um, where they had to use um, different water baths to study changes um, to study how the position of equilibrium shift and then decide on the delta H of the experiment. So I can just um, play it for you and you can just see how the color of the mixture really changes and that's what um, got my students quite excited also lah. I'm stirring it in the ice bath. Of course, not the best lab technique, just for demonstration. So initially, it was more like a lilac color. Now the test uh, solution is turning to a more lighter um, shade of purple, closer to pink already. So when I put it in warm water bath, uh, you can also see the difference in the mouth. We can already start to see the solution changing from the pink to a deep blue. I wouldn't like exactly say dark blue, but yeah, so it was enough to indicate a shift in the position of the equilibrium. Okay, yeah, so I hope uh, the video helped you to kind of visualize what I was talking about. Uh, so some pictures have, uh, I, I brought the materials to the classroom because um, at that time there was some um, uh, difficulty in trying to get my class to get into the lab uh, because of um, limited space, right? But uh, nonetheless, it was actually doable. So uh, if you can see like this, uh, my student, I packed the calcium chloride in small containers, small vials, and then they were able to do the pouring and the mixing quite simply um, in the classroom. Uh, thankfully, um, no spillage, but um, regardless, um, it, I didn't give them a lot of solutions to deal with, uh, so I think it was still manageable, yeah. Okay, and then uh, in the worksheet, I also got them to, I encouraged them to draw. And in fact, I didn't expect them to use their colored pens to represent the uh, layers they saw. So I thought it was also quite a good coincidence that the two colors are like um, common colors of common pen colors. So I think that also helped the students to record their observations uh, simply like, without much uh, activation energy. Yeah. Okay, so... um. The next set of pictures are actually from the workshop that uh, Chongxin mentioned. So we also conducted this with a group of teachers. And you can see that like, for 16-year-old uh, um, students to uh, adult learners, the, the level of excitement was comparable. So I thought that actually the, the fact that we could use um, vis um, like phenomena or like uh, visual observations to engage learning was um, quite powerful in this sense. I also learned how powerful it was like, through... Um, uh, designing this whole series of uh, lessons. Yeah, okay. So um, with that, uh, that is the, all we have prepared. Um, we just also want to uh, thank a few people. Lah. Yeah, so uh, Chongxin, you can take over. Uh, yeah, so of course, the organizing committee of uh, SISTEC and of course, Hua Chong Institution, um, the school leaders for often giving us the, the support to try out whatever things we want. And of course, past and present collaborators, uh, that that really includes um everybody who has collab collaborated with us, especially the members in the NLCs. Yeah, and of course, uh, next uh, this will be the NLC photos we took uh, right after we conducted the workshop. So in this year we conducted the workshop live in face to face in Nagoya Junior College, and we of course we want to thank them for hosting us. But the workshop we conducted is not exactly on inquiry base, but uh, inquiry base is just part of it. Yeah. So with that, uh, Justin and I thank everyone. Uh, very much to, for listening to us and we'll be happy to take any questions.